Welcome back. Now, the Rao Peting Lord Mayor Elias Lukwago and the Executive Director Jennifer Msisi appears to have crippled service delivery in the city. While we have seen some changes here and there, Kampala is still quite symbolic with its traffic snarl ups, buildings sprouting up on every corner, pothole riddle roads, a garbage problem, and a border border cyclist menaced. With no end in sight of a protracted legal battle, how can we resolve the impasse at City Hall? That is the talk of the nation tonight. And as always, I'm joined by Makere University Law Dawn, Dr. Wasinje Kabumba. Good evening, Dr. Wasinje. Good evening. Richard. I'm going to have to get used to saying <laughs> Dr. Musinji. So when I forget, please do forgive me. We'll get right into the discussion. Yes, Our service yeah. delivery seems to be yeah. limping at city, as City Hall fails mm -hmm. to resolve the impasse between the Lord Mayor and mm -hmm. the ED. Mm -hmm. Why do we have a conflict? Just help us try and understand the conflict at City Hall. Yeah, the conflict is one that is written into the Act. It's actually, if you look at the 2010 KCCA Act, it, it just tears in the face. You have a political head who is the Lord Mayor, and you have the head of the technical wing, who is the ED. And their functions are very similar. You have both of them being mandated to do something that looks like monitor. One part of the act says monitor, the other is supposed to supervise. Now what's the difference between monitoring and supervision? It's pretty much the same thing. Precisely. So you had, uh, and um, one way of looking at it is that, you know, there was a deliberate um, um, uh, vagueness in the act, and that that vagueness works for one party. Very much like what we saw last week in terms of the current impasse in the, in the judiciary, in terms of the, uh, the CJ. Some confusion happens. Some other confusion at times is deliberate in the sense of, uh, because, uh, and the trick normally is to see who, for whom it works and, and, and who benefits from lack of clarity. For a long time, there were political opposition persons as mayors of Kampala City, which was a problem. And mm -hmm. that was a problem that needed solving. And we were told about two weeks ago by uh, um, the head of state that, well, we watered down the constitutional provisions. So in 2005, there was an amendment that provided for Kampala City being part of one of the regions of Uganda. And then in uh, 2010, then you had the KCC Act, creating this deliberate, um, you know, uh, divergence of powers. But crucially also taking a very serious mandate from the people. And so saying, well, you have elected a mayor, but I'm going to take the power and give it to someone, someone who's appointed else. by myself, you know, the head of state through a minister. And so that's where the challenge comes from, the idea that the law is being used to meet a political end. You mentioned something very interesting, um, and you yeah. referred to something that the president said. Yeah. And there is the question of the law and its intricacies, yeah. which the president, like you said, recently alluded to when he yeah. said Lukwago was offered a drink from the poisoned chalice. Yeah. Can the law, is there any way the law can now be streamlined for the sake of service delivery? And you see, this is where I think we've been talking for quite some time now about um, the difficulty of looking at things in a legal lens. And so now even as lawyers, we're in a very uncertain terrain, we have to step back and recognize the political and economic factors that influence the law that we shape. And as long as and lawyers are not willing to do that, we shall remain um, more or less like masons, you know, technicians not dealing with the, you know, the, the real map of what's happening. So you have a law that we are being told now was crafted deliberately to achieve a particular purpose. We have a judicial system now that has been crafted also to achieve political ends. In that game of chess, you can't win unless you recognize <coughs> who is making the rules, who controls the pieces. And, uh, and for me today, a very clear sign was the order issued by Justice Lydia Mugambi on a Friday. Mm -hmm. That was supposed to have the Lord Mayor back in office on Monday <coughs> when preparations were made and we saw a cock being you know, repaired. That very morning as that was being done, a single judge of the Court of Appeal was saying you can reverse this entire thing. So that's where we are now, where the law, lawyers, and in a sense, even uh, the judiciary is being now used to advance uh, political ends. So obviously the, the <coughs> role of politics in the management of City Hall has yeah. carries severe implications. I mean, yeah. on the one hand, we have government that has given uh, the ED goodwill and yeah. the financial war chest, obviously. Yes. But then we have the continuous meddling of government, which yeah. seems to have worsened the rift between the Lord Mayor and yeah. the ED. Yeah. Does it really, really have to be this way? Is there no other way about it? Yeah, you see, the, the, the challenge really now, eh, and there's the politics is one thing, but there's also a question about a class struggle, I think, and, and we have to recognize that, that there are two Kampalas. You have the Javas Kampala, the one that goes to Akesha Mall and watches movies, etc. And then you have the Kampala of the slum, those who are not serviced by Umeme, who are not dealt with by national order. The underdogs. The underdogs. Society. So you have, and the underdogs are more. The poor are more. So 
and you have a challenge then. So yeah, if you have an elected Lord Mayor who has to you know, respond to those of his, you know, his, his electorate, and you have the few, the elite, who also have their concerns which are not met by that, what you have now is a class struggle being played out through law, where now you have the ED to cater for street lighting, ETC, for those who want that sort of thing and who want garbage collection, ETC, who benefit from that. Then you have the Lord Mayor who was really serving the majority of us who are poor. So you have slum dwellers, for instance, pavement dwellers, who are being kicked off the streets to make way for development. So the question, of course, that comes to mind is what kind of development? Is it quantitative? Is it in terms of buildings, the skyline of Kampala? Or is it qualitative in terms of human development? And, and these are things that around the world are being struggled with. In India, that is similar case, Telis versus Mumbai. It's the same scenario where you had slum dwellers being kicked off the streets, and the court says, you can't have development at the expense of people's livelihoods. And actually, they found that was a violation of the right to life. So beyond the politics, there's also, I think, a very important economic struggle, a clash of visions about what kind of development we, see, we need to see, what development means, for whom development uh, means. And I think this is where these struggles will become more important, I think, as we go ahead. But does, does that, just help me understand something. Does yeah. that mean yeah. that these two categories can actually not coexist in harmony? Because they are always going to be there. Can the, they not yeah. coexist in harmony? And that is they, they might find ways, but the question becomes who determines that harmony? Who determines when there's that stability? Right now you have um, the elite who are few using uh, political power and the coercive arm of the state to say, well, the harmony is found by you guys living. And if you had the masses in charge, which would be the case? And that's where another question becomes, really the question is, do we want democracy with its full implications? Because democracy with its full implication means those who are more, even if they are poor and have a different vision and different needs and concerns at the moment, must determine where we are now. But so the question, must democracy have its limits? Do we want to limit that to achieve certain ends, or some sort of benevolent dictatorship? But if we take that route, we must be willing to live with the consequences of it. Because today it's those people in Kisanyu being dealt with because we want them to be, be dealt with. Then tomorrow if it comes to <coughs> us, you know, so I think there's that sort of struggle. It's, it's, it's doctrinal about democracy and some ill effects of democracy and the harmony you're talking about between these classes. But who determines? Who sets the rules? Who, how do you determine that harmony? Who determines the balance? I think that's where what we're looking at now. Do we have some examples where, um, where there's some sort of harmony? It's essentially From around the world? <laughs> I can't think of any because essentially it's a struggle for survival and for, uh, and, and some of it has been seen in violent revolution. We have seen it in, in a number of, the Arab Spring really is a struggle about, was a struggle. Well, it, it came out in terms of politics, but it was about survival. The Tunisian person who burnt himself was a person who wanted to sell, actually the pavement dweller, selling his way on the street, very much like Kampala now. The police says, go away, and he says, you're killing me, and sets himself on fire. So I, I don't think there's an easy answer. I don't think there's a simple solution. One side must win, I think. Okay, let's turn to um, one of the issues raised by some critics, and that's yep. favoritism as far as the wage bill goes. <coughs> we have people earning 40 million shillings mm -hmm. a month. Yeah. And then on the other hand, we have a surgeon at Mulago earning yeah. 2 million shillings. And then we have yeah. you guys yes. earning 1.5 million 1 shillings. 1.5, you, you can know? imagine. Is it asking for too much yes. to have the yeah. wage bill across yeah. the civil service harmonized? Yeah. No, I don't think, and of course I'm an interested party because <laughs> the, the, I, I think it's about um, parity, it's about equity. And, and for as long as you have those, then it, it, it sounds very hollow to say, do your part for the country, patriotism, etc. if you have these <coughs> widely divergent things. Of course, some people must earn money, but the, if there must be some sort of uh, clear principle. Who gets what? How do you determine who gets what? And, uh, and for as long as you don't have that, then people are going to vote with their feet. You have lecturers going away, going to countries like Botswana, South Africa, lots of Ugandans. You have doctors leaving, loads of doctors just next door in Kenya, and elsewhere. So for the long as you don't get that, you have, we train them. We shall keep training them at, at Mulago and they're very good, they come out and, then and they go, precisely, and you can't stop them. So there are real costs, real economic costs in terms of it. So just imagine how much training went into that and then you lose it in that at the end point. And then you have to then, you know, go backwards, try to recruit them. So I think there are real costs to not having a, a system that makes sense in terms of wages. Okay, thank you so much for joining us on Talk of the Nation. Thank you. That was Makere Law <coughs> Don, Dr. Businje Kabumba joining us on Talk of the Nation. We will take another short break and return shortly with NTV Weekend Sport.